When you distill R123, do you run it through an ice trap or just pull vapor off the tank and put it in the machine? Uh, I think I need a cold trap set up. Worried about moisture, but my boss is telling me uh, to just pull vapor off the top of the tank and that's good enough. This answer is going to be true regardless of most of the refrigerants. Okay, so there are some exceptions. Something that we need to understand. Um, one, water itself is a condensable, right? So this is a low pressure machine that, that is getting asked about specifically, but it's not just true to low pressure. Now, in the context of a low pressure machine, uh, we've got a purge unit, and that purge unit is removing non-condensables. But water is a condensable, and it has the ability to condense down in that system. And that's where we have the purge uh, filter, which is just a, a type of dryer to try to help capture some of that moisture that does get condensed. We also have other dryers typically uh, throughout the chiller that, uh, like a CVH, for example, will have the eductor dryer uh, that we can filter moisture and stuff out. Why do we have an eductor dryer as well when we're dealing with moisture? Well, that goes to, to the point of the refrigerant is most refrigerants are dense or hmm, they have a, a, a heavier specific gravity. So specific gravity is based off of water. And so water is a gravity of one. Now, uh, 123 is this example. I, I looked some of these up ahead of time. So 123 is a gravity of 1.47, which means that it is heavier than water and it will sink down to the bottom while liquid water will rise to the top. Now, the water will still get intermixed with the refrigerant. Like it's not a complete separation, but similarly to how oil will sit on top of water, oil, like in most of our compressor oils, have a specific gravity of somewhere between 0.8 to 0 0.9, 0 0.98, somewhere in there, just lighter than water itself. So oils will rise to the top of that water. So what's handy about having a dryer on the adductor system, uh, which is an oil return circuit, it allows us to capture any liquid water if it's in small increments, mind you. Um, that would be floating on top of the refrigerant, which is where your water will typically be. Uh, so it's going to be rising to the top of that. Now, in this particular case, um, we've got, excluding the 123 side of this, we've got a refrigerant that they're worried has water in it. For most refrigerants, that water is going to be sitting on top of the refrigerant if it's in a liquid state, like we've got actual liquid standing water, which can happen. There's a couple of ways to go about this, but I wanna to respond to the recommendation by the boss first. So the boss says, well, just boil it off and it'll be good enough. Now, the boiling point of water uh, to get it to boil at about 75 degrees is like negative 14 PSIG. So uh, six, significantly deeper than you would have to pull most refrigerants, right? Most refrigerants we can boil uh, well above at a you know reasonable ambient of say 70-ish degrees. We can boil well above water's boiling point by, by the pressure dropping. Something else is going to happen though. You won't be necessarily boiling the water off, but because the water is on top, that water is going to get caught pretty significantly by that refrigerant vapor pulling up through it. And this is something where I, I see a, a difference in the material itself between, say, water and, um, and oil. So a common practice if we have an oil latent refrigerant that oil will rise to the top of the refrigerant, um, but we can boil that refrigerant back through that oil and actually get a pretty decent job of separating the two. But I have not found that to be as true with water. What I found with water is it tends to get grabbed by the water, the, the, the refrigerant vapor as it boils off and it intermixes more 
than I have seen it do with oil. And so you end up, you, you don't end up actually getting a, a clean refrigerant back into your, um, back into your machine as well as you might have if you had done that same process with oil. So part of the point there is you are having to boil that refrigerant through the water that is there. And especially if it's a fairly minimal amount of water to begin with, like it's a pretty high chance that if you've got enough refrigerant in your cylinder, uh, it's going to get boiled out or the majority of it's going to end up getting carried back into the machine anyway. Then trying to filter that much water back out of the refrigerant through relying on the filter dryers, it takes a lot of dryer changes and it takes a long time. And that's given the fact that you've corrected whatever issues were happening that allowed the, the water to get there to begin with. You know, so saying that you actually did fix whatever the situation was. So you shouldn't go against your boss. Okay. I am not overriding your boss or any other authority that is making these decisions. I am just providing some additional thought around this and that I have a further recommendation. So the other side of that is okay. Cold traps. So if you don't know, a cold trap, it's a dual canister assembly where we've got a larger cylinder that the, uh, the vapors would get pulled through. Now, typically we do this with an evacuation, mind you. But we would pull the vapors through uh, a larger cylinder. I, I would refer, refer to it in the service training program as the primary cylinder. And then we have a secondary smaller cylinder that sits down inside of the primary. We will fill the secondary cylinder with a uh, isopropyl alcohol mixture and dry ice, which will end up causing the outside, any moisture that comes in contact with the outside of that second cylinder to freeze to it and stick. Now, something I did was just using filter dryers like the Sporlin 305s, which is a 3.8 uh, three uh, filter dryer uh, with 30 cubic inch. Wonderful dryer, or 3.8, no, 5.8, I'm sorry, 5.8 dryer. Anyway, the Sporlin 305 is, it's large enough. It has a really good capacity. I don't think they make it in a high water content version like they do some of the dryer cores. Like you can get the, uh, with the RCW, uh, for a core versus the actual uh, canister dryer. Setting one of those up and then using that as a pass through between multiple tanks, right? So you have one dryer coming into your recovery machine, you have one dryer leaving the recovery machine, run in series with your hoses, and you would just transfer between tanks a few times. And you're gonna go through, especially with heavy moisture, you're gonna go through several dryers in that process. And basically every time you would sw swap tanks, uh, you would end up swapping dryers. Now, I have had some cases where the refrigerant was bad enough that before I could even finish pulling off the first tank, uh, I'd already plugged up one of the dryers and I had to stop mid recovery or mid transfer and uh, change the dryer out then. Like I've, I've had some of those scenarios. So just something to keep in mind. But if, if you didn't, I, I do want to preface the cold trap of specifically meant in the context of we're going to use this in a uh in a, an evacuation perspective it's not technically meant for using in a transfer environment where we're moving refrigerant we're trying to remove moisture and such right so uh, i do want to clarify that 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 is the intended purpose of using cold traps if you don't have that you've never used that my recommendation would be it doesn't take that much time. Just use the filter dryer method, get an extra recovery cylinder and just transfer that charge at least once or twice. Do something to get some of that heavy moisture latency out of there, because as that refrigerant passes through there, you'll still end up uh, one. You can move liquid at that point, right? So you can just transfer liquid back and forth, which is much faster than trying to boil, boil a whole a, a cylinder off. So it doesn't take that much time. You can just move liquid uh, between the two, but then you can filter that water out much better. Now, when I say move liquid, you may have a recovery machine that can't 
do a liquid transfer like that. So what you would do in that circumstance is treat it like a push-pull. You would come out of the contaminated tank's liquid line, you would hit a filter dryer, and then it would come out of the dryer and into the liquid line of the, uh, the, the transfer tank, the tank you want everything to move into. Then you'd come off of the vapor port of the transfer tank, run that vapor line through your recovery machine, and then into the other tank the other tanks vapor port by doing that you've essentially configured your tanks in a push pull environment to where instead of having to move all of that through your recovery machine maybe you don't want to contaminate it maybe you can't move liquid through it because of the particular one you have then it allows you to still do the same process where you can transfer the liquid version of that refrigerant back and forth and you've just got this single dryer to to deal with and just keep in mind that if you end up in a position where things severely slow down or it, everything doesn't move like it needs to, you would start to see the pressure pull down significantly on your uh, cylinder that you're transferring into. That could be a sign that that dryer is beginning to get plugged up or stopped up in some way. And you could also put some T's in with some stubby gauges or something across your dryer because most of these dryers don't have pressure taps. So you could put some T's in, in the line and actually watch the pressure drop in your dryer. And once it gets about two, three PSI uh, difference across there, um, assuming you've got some properly calibrated gauges, then you would just know, okay, let's go ahead and stop. Let's change this dryer out. Uh, and then we can keep moving. So that would be a better recommended way of trying to filter that that water out of there before you try to get it back in the machine end of the day you as a technician if you're just if if the directive is to do as what was described here just boil it off good enough roll on with it then it, do what you're what you need to do right you have to make that call uh it's it's your your boss your environment your customer i can't um say one way or the other on that but my recommendation it would be to urge them to at least let hey let's go the filter dryer path give me an extra 30 minutes give me one hour uh i mean granted saying you have everything on hand okay but just give me a little bit of time and it's going to save us so much effort and it's going to protect the customer so much more on the back end if we just take a little bit of time right now if you're not already in chiller academy i'd really encourage you to go check it out just think about it right uh, this is what I do full time. I, I've, I've committed, I've stepped out of the field, committed my career to this going forward. This is what I've always wanted to do and to be able to educate, help others and grow and help this industry take step, steps forward. Um, so chilleracademy.com, like I'd, I'd love to be able to work with you over there. We've got a community page. Uh, every, all the lessons have a comment section. That's what I spend a lot of my day doing. If I'm not working on the lesson material itself, then I am in the comments and I'm trying to respond to those as fast as I can, uh, in addition to helping you through email and otherwise. So love to be able to work with you. For all of those that are in the academy, y'all are doing some great work out there. Keep it up. I really appreciate the support and the feedback that you've given.